Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, the special relationship is finally being put to the test this weekend as US President Joe Biden and the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson meet at the G7 summit in the southwest of England. Following the success of last week's agreement forged by the group's finance ministers to attain a global minimum corporate tax, trade is likely to be high up on the agenda. Former Europe Minister for the British Parliament, Dr Dennis McShane, will be joining me later from London to discuss the key talking points of the gathering. The Nigerian Youth Service Courts has partnered with one of Africa's largest job-seeking sites, Jobberman, to train 120,000 youth corpus a year. Jobberman CEO Rolake Roshiji will be speaking with me from Lagos to provide more insight on the company's vision to place three million young people in dignified employment. Then later, I'll be reporting on the biggest company news stories of the week. But first, let's start the show with business news from here in the UK, where the island of Ireland is back in the Brexit spotlight. Officials at the European Union have warned the UK that it will act firmly and resolutely if London reneges on its commitment in the Northern Ireland Protocol. This comes amid reports that the grace period for the chilled meats in Northern Irish shops could be extended past June. Business owners in the region have called for an end to trade frictions, calling for hurdles imposed by the agreement to be removed. Writing in the Daily Telegraph, European Commission Vice President Marov Sefcovic said the EU will not be shy to take action against the UK. In other British business news, the UK is playing host to G7 members in Cornwall this weekend. It's the first time the leading nations group has convened since the start of the pandemic. Global trade is likely to be high on the agenda alongside Brexit. China, vaccines and climate change. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, it's all kicking off in Cornwall. What can we expect over the next well, couple of days? As always, Cornwall is the centre of the world. I mean, it's a, it's a strange place. I think a lot of people coming from abroad, from America and from Europe will think it's quite a strange but quite a, a cute place to go in England. It's where a lot of um, sort of richer people in the south, if they're not going to leave the UK to go on holiday, they'll go to Cornwall because the beaches are lovely. So they're going to a place called Carbis Bay, which is a Seaside village near St Ives on the um, on the southwest coast. It happens this weekend, um, and yeah, the UK is the president of the G7 this year, and so Boris Johnson gets to set the agenda, and he's chosen uh, probably not too controversially the pandemic as to focus on the first, and climate change the second. So um, he's he's always been quite green himself, um, and this kind of fits the Conservative manifesto, I guess. Um, and so the seven countries are all going to be coming to the UK to Cornwall, um, and uh, Boris will will meet. Uh, President Joe Biden for the first time that he's been president. Um, and Joe Biden comes with quite a personal thing. The Good Friday Agreement is something that he's sort of been briefing on that he wants to talk to G7 leaders about, um, and notably Britain and, and, and the European leaders. Um, he wants to make sure that the any kind of EU-UK um, trade row um, does not get in the way of the Good Friday Agreement and therefore you know, stir things up in Northern Ireland. We did see a few months ago um, some rioting in Northern Ireland as a result of certain trade issues. So he wants to make sure, obviously, he um, has Irish connections himself. He wants to make sure that that um, isn't an issue. But there will be other things other than um, uh, other than the pandemic and climate change. The, the new global minimum corporation tax that G7 finance ministers came to a broad agreement a couple of days ago. This is companies like Microsoft and Google that for a long time have managed to sort of dodge corporation tax. Um, well, that looks like it's going to come to an end, or at least um, for these leaders, they're trying to work on a 15% corporation tax so that all of these huge mega tech corporate companies can be taxed um, sort of, uh, you know, all of them at the same time in, across the world. And that obviously there needs more to be done. China and India need to be on board as well. Um, but it's a start at least. Um, actually, on that, Rishi Sunak just today has been trying to push for um, financial service companies not to be part of this. So he's trying to kind of wedge out the city of London to have a kind of special treatment. And I'm not sure how well that will go. But obviously, after Brexit, a lot of people were saying, actually, the city of London has not really been catered for in these Brexit agreements. And a lot of 
companies in London were looking to move to Europe as a result of that. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets on there. And then there's obviously lots of conflicts that they'll discuss, things like Russia and the Navalny and the protests there, Belarus, the journalist that was arrested um, in the middle of the skies, Syria, the civil war continuing over there, things like Israel, Palestine and China and Hong Kong. So there's a lot of things to get through. It is worth noting that none of this is binding. It's all more sort of chit chat and uh, you know a bit of networking, but it's not really like any laws can be put in place there. Um, but this is really kind of how the world works. It's always, you know, you have your governments and you have your official things, but actually it's behind closed doors, it's the little meetings, and maybe a couple of trade deals can kind of go on there. But yeah, it's, it's the, the G7, as it says on the tin, it's the group of seven, it used to be the group of eight when Russia was in it. Um, but there will be a couple of other leaders there as well, the leader of India, Narendra Modi, Australia, um, South Korea, Ban Ki-moon. So it'll be interesting to see what happens this weekend in a tiny Cornish town. Um, and I'm sure lots of headlines will come out of this and we'll probably be talking about it next week. Are we there during the summer? Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Let's stay with the G7 now, but shift our attention to some of the sideline topics that are likely to arise, namely Brexit. Earlier this week, crunch talks took place in London between both sides to try and ease tensions over the Northern Ireland Protocol. This comes amid reports that the grace period for the chilled meats including British sausages, in northern Irish shops, could be extended past June. The UK has unilaterally pushed back the full implementation of checks on supermarket goods and parcels to ease this disruption, prompting the EU to accuse the UK of undermining the protocol and beginning legal action. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by former Europe Minister for the British Parliament, Dr Dennis McShane. Dr. Dennis Machane, thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. The British press are calling this row between Westminster and Brussels sausage wars. It's actually over a pretty serious subject, which is, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Do you think um, this discussion is likely to spill out into the G7 talks this weekend? For sure, because first of all, President Joe Biden's coming here. And just before he left to go be inaugurated, he referred to himself, he said, I'm Irish. And he is of an Irish background. He's always been proud of the Irish connections. He's always had a watchful look over the whole of Ireland. And I think he'll be very upset that the Good Friday Agreement, which America feels it helped to broker, and the Democrats helped to broker, and uh, he helped to broker as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time, is now under any kind of threat. Secondly, you've got Angela Merkel arriving for her last G7, and President Macron arriving, and Mario Draghi, uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, is making a big success of his premiership. Three big European leaders. And they're really going to be fed up with the idea that a handful of uh, politicians in Northern Ireland who dislike Europe, dislike Catholics, dislike Dublin, dislike the Good Friday Agreement, are kind of jerking Boris Johnson around. So I think, I, I hope there'll be a solution before the G7 starts. But if it doesn't, then I think there'll be behind the scenes, because these are informal discussions, uh, there'll be some pretty plain speaking to the British government to get your house in order and stop playing games. Absolutely. You've mentioned some of the big names. Uh, one missing is Ursula von der Leyen, of course. Uh, the EU um, have been invited as well as um, other um, heads of non-G7 um, members. How do you think the reception is going to be towards uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson? Of course, we know he's a populist leader, pretty popular here in the UK. Um, you know, he's a bit like Marmite. You either love him or you don't, although he has, you know, proven himself at the polls. Um, what presence do you think Britain will have on this main stage, given the fact that it is pretty symbolic, the fact that, uh, um, you know, Angela Merkel, it's her last one. Uh, Joe Biden, this is the first time he's been here, um, you know, as the US uh, president. How, how will uh, Boris Johnson and Britain be received over the next couple of days? I think you'll be well received. Look, these men and women who come to the top of their countries, they're in a very unique club. They may have different politics. They may have different views of personalities. But they know they have to rub along and get along together. So I've attended some of these meetings, and it's all fairly polite. The G7 is 
informal. So there's not a set agenda. People aren't taking minutes. People aren't publishing press statements every five seconds. I'm very interested to see how big a demonstration there might be. It's down in Cornwall, at a very lovely isolated village. But you can, you know, the guys who are very angry about the environment, about drop the debt, about all the big issues of the world, they can come in on boats and dinghies and scale cliffs and come down from trees and try and make a big fuss. But there are three big challenges that everybody's got around the world. Number one, how to get back onto a track of recovery. Number two, uh, how to vaccinate the world. That's been launched by Gordon Brown in this country, the former British Prime Minister, but supported by 200 world leaders, the heads of the UN, the WHO. They're all saying, for goodness sake, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, Angela Merkel, you're the richest countries in the world. Spare us a dime to vaccinate our people. And I think that would be a huge pressure. And then thirdly, that continuing drive uh, to decarbonize uh, as much of the world economy as is possible. So three big agenda items where there's unity in what people want to see happen, not exactly agreement on how to achieve it, but I think everybody will want to be on their best behaviour because you're going to put the richest people in the world in a very rich luxury resort in southern England and then everybody to turn around to Africa or Latin America and say drop dead we're not interested in you we only want to fax our own people etc we're only interested in our own wealth so this is going to be a, a you know, very charged a very interesting G7. Absolutely uh, thank you uh, Dr McShane for um, you know uh, explaining the kind of informal format, uh, so to speak, of uh, the G7. Um, some are suggesting that, you know, um, it's not really the main uh, setting for international diplomacy, that that is going to be at the G20 in Vienna uh, next month. Would you agree, you know, if, you, if you're having big international uh, discussions and you don't have the likes of Putin and Xi Jinping there, then it's not really an international um, discussion. It's a discussion between democracies, and neither President Xi uh, nor Vladimir Putin rule over democracies, are interested in democracy, uh, and uh, are responsible in any way to their own people. I mean, Boris Johnson is a contested figure. Um, uh, Emmanuel Macron certainly is in France at the moment. Somebody slapped him in the face uh, the other day. Angela Merkel is going. Uh, Joe Biden has got incredible tension with the leftover Trump followers in America. And Xi and Putin can just waltz in and whatever they want to do, whoever they want to kill, whatever news media they want to suppress, they can get away with it. So this is the key one, uh, and it will set the tone, I'd say, uh, because if G7 ducks set the key questions I set out, economic requiring, vaxing the world, moving forward on the climate challenge, and says passes it to the G20, well, the G20 won't be able to do anything. Yeah, absolutely right. Before I let you go, what headlines? I know you've already spelled it out, but what other headlines do you think we can expect this weekend? Do you think the special relationship is still intact? Fascinating you ask that question because Boris Johnson's just given a very, very long interview to the Atlantic magazine that, that's published here and in America. A very, very good magazine. And uh, he said he didn't like using the term special relationship because it was needy. He used that very English word, needy. Uh, I don't know how you translate that into French or German or anything. And so perhaps, oddly enough, he is more of a modernizer than we think, because certainly I worked in Washington a lot as a minister. Nobody in America ever uses the term special relationship. But you come back to Britain, they're always banging on about it. Boris Johnson, I think, knows that Joe Biden isn't his cup of tea. Doesn't mean to say they won't get along, doesn't mean to say they don't have to solve problems in a similar way. But uh, America and Britain are going to pursue their own paths. Joe Biden will want to build a very strong relationship, above all with Emmanuel Macron, uh, because one assumes he'll be re-elected next year. So he'll really be the top dog in, in Europe for the next two or three years. And we're all, everybody's waiting to see exactly 
where the Boris Johnson version of Brexit ends up. And if certainly the headline stories when they meet in Cornwall is a huge row in Northern Ireland because a tiny proportion of the Northern Irish political class won't accept the deal that Boris Johnson himself negotiated, that's the problem, then uh, that's, that could really, really spoil and soil the entire G7 uh, meeting. So, no, I mean, Britain's left Europe. We don't have a special relationship. We're out on the oceans by ourselves, sort of, sort of creating our own destiny in the future. Let's wait and see what happens. Absolutely. Some fabulous insights from you there. Dr Dennis McShane, former Europe Minister for Britain's uh, Labour Party. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. In a few minutes, I'll be discussing Jobberman's new youth training partnership with the Nigerian Youth Service Corps with the company CEO, Rolake Roshiji. But before then, here's some company news for you. The World Bank has raised its global growth forecast this year to 5.6% from its previous estimate of 4.1% announced in January. According to the group's latest report, major economies are the primary drivers of growth as developing countries are still struggling with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Bank has described the global recovery as the strongest upturn after a crisis in 80 years. US growth is expected to reach 6.8%, 4.2% growth is expected in the Eurozone and 8.5% growth has been projected for China. Spain has reopened its borders to fully vaccinated tourists this week as the country attempts to reclaim its global leadership in tourism. Last year, the sector plunged 80% in Spain as restrictions brought travel to a virtual standstill, leaving its beaches and hotels almost deserted. The world's second most visited country is heavily dependent on tourism and last month the government slashed its forecast for this year's economic recovery to 6.5%. Among the conditions for entry, travellers from outside of the EU must have been vaccinated at least 14 days before arrival. The US Justice Department has announced that it has recovered more than half of the $4.4 million paid by Colonial Pipeline to ransomware extortionist Darkseid who forced the shutdown of the major fuel network. Darkseid infiltrated the pipeline last month in an attack that severely disrupted supplies, prompting a spike in fuel prices, panic buying and shortages. To regain access, the pipeline bosses were forced to pay millions of dollars. The Justice Department said the FBI was able to seize 63.7 Bitcoin from a cryptocurrency wallet from Darkseid, which Washington officials believe could be based in Russia. The White House has urged business executives to step up security measures to protect against ransomware attacks. The Nigerian Youth Service Corps has partnered with one of Africa's largest job-seeking sites, Jobberman, to train 120,000 youth corpus a year. The free soft skills training course, now synonymous with the job of the name, will take place in NYSE camps across 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory. The revered national institution, which focuses on bringing thousands of youth together from around Nigeria, provides a pivotal step for jobbermen in tackling the enormity of unemployment and underemployment issues amongst the country's 100 million youth. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by the CEO of Jobberman, Rolake Roshiji, who joins me now from Lagos. Rolake Roshiji, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. And what an amazing initiative you are striving uh, to achieve. Can you tell us exactly how Jobberman managed to gain uh, such an important partnership with the NYSC? Thank you so much and thank you for having me with you this morning. Um, well, it's definitely been a long work in progress and it, it's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears um, just to um, get this partnership going. Um, NYSC have been fantastic. Um, they've really welcomed us on board and um, we reached out to them because Jobberman has a target of training up 5 million Nigerians by 2025 um, as part of our partnership with the MasterCard Foundation to upskill youths and put them in dignified employment. So we thought, where can we access a large number of youths who are gathered already together? And we thought, okay, NYSC, it's such a revered institution in Nigeria. Um, most young Nigerians go through it. So we reached out to NYSC and um, yeah, and then everything happened from there. So it's been a long discussion, but we're, we're really pleased that it's finally kicked off. Absolutely. And the timing uh, couldn't be uh, uh, better. You piloted the scheme back in February. Um, how did it go? And kind of what changes will you be making to the larger rollout later this year? 
Yeah, great question. So we piloted the scheme in February and um, we're aiming to train young people across all 36 states in Nigeria and to train 120,000 of them. So during our pilot, um, it went well. We had a great reception from the students. I went to one of the trainings in Ikeja in Lagos and the energy was palpable. I mean, these are young Nigerians. They finished university. They want to get their first jobs. They, they love being in the room, caring about, you know, soft skills cover so many things. It's employability, it's personal effectiveness, it's time management. So the pilot went well, and we're looking forward to the rest of the year um, where we will be training across all the states in Nigeria. Well, okay, you've decided to focus on soft skill training. Can you explain why? And what do you think are some of the root causes for uh, mass youth unemployment in Nigeria? So a lot of people hear soft skills and they think of something wishy-washy or what does soft skills really mean? How does that help me get a job? Um, but we made a very intentional decision to focus on soft skills training because research actually shows that technical skills, so if you want to be an accountant, you know, having your ACCA or ACA qualifications, um, we found out that technical skills only counts 15% to most employers when they're recruiting. And soft skills count 85% um, as part of that choice of deciding who you would like to work with you. And this also extends to retention. I mean, we all know it <laughs> in our workplaces, the people who get retained are those who show up to the office on time, um, time management, those who work well in a team, that's teamwork, people who are effective um, in their performance, that's personal effectiveness. Um, so we made a very intentional decision um, using um, research from the International Labour Organization to, to focus on soft skills. Um, as you said it yourself, the timing couldn't be any better. We're in a very tough situation in Nigeria right now. Unemployment is now a whopping 33%. And those rates are even higher amongst young people between the ages of 15 to 34. Um, so those rates are as high in some states across Nigeria as, as high as 40%. So that means if you go to some states like Jigawa in Nigeria and you are in a bus full of people, you know, unemployment is 40 percent. So that's pretty much saying more than one in three people in that bus are unemployed. Um, so it, it, the timing couldn't be better. Um, we really want to help young people have the confidence and um, the right skills to first get the job and then to keep the job. So we made that very intentional decision to focus on soft skills and to do it right now. Um, when things are really hard in the economy. Jobberman is massive, and I can only imagine, Rolike, just how full your in-tray is. We've gone through a pretty tough time. I know some countries are out of the pandemic, others are witnessing their third and fourth waves. What are some of the labour market trends that Jobberman have picked up, especially um, when it comes to viable positions. We've been hearing that a lot in the West, particularly London, talking about jobs that unfortunately are just going to uh, wither away. What are some of the striking things that you've uh, witnessed over the past 18 months? Yeah, fantastic question. So we actually did a report on the impact of COVID-19 on the job market in Nigeria. And, you know, as much as we lament the really poor situation right now with unemployment being so high, there's some really positive and interesting trends. So there have been an increase in jobs in sectors such as banking and finance. We've been lucky enough through the data we get on Jobberman to see that there's been higher numbers of companies looking for people to, to work in banking and finance over the last nine months than the previous nine months in 2020 and 2019. Um, similarly, the IT sector has seen an increase in the number of people um, being employed and also advertising um, and branding. So these are really positive insights. So, you know, what we're encouraging young people is, hey, see where the trends are, see where the jobs are growing and try and position yourselves with the right skills um, to take on these jobs. Um, people, anyone can log on to our website at jobberman.com and have a look at this COVID-19 report on the impact on labor trends in Nigeria. And you can actually read about the sorts of jobs that the banking sector is looking for. They're looking for more marketing executives, more business development managers. The IT sector is looking for more software developers, more UI UX developers. So these are really positive trends. And, you know, to your last question um, about, you know, what are the causes of unemployment in Nigeria? 
really, it's all driven overall by the economy. It's, it's driven by the, the slowdown in the economy and labor intensive sectors not growing fast enough. So if you think about labor intensive sectors, we need more jobs in manufacturing. We need more jobs in agriculture. Um, we need more jobs where people are required. So, you know, the government is making strides and the private economy. So we're hoping that, you know, in the coming year, there will be an increase in jobs um, across manufacturing, across agriculture, um, which will um, hopefully bring down the unemployment numbers. Rolaki Roshiji, CEO of Jobman, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global and good luck with this pretty life-changing as partnership you have there with the NYSC. Thank you. Sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channel's Business Global. Goodbye. <laughs>